Hello, military and aerospace enthusiasts. Welcome to our channel, Deep Dive Defense. Over here we take a deep look from unusual angles, which may challenge your mind. So let's dive right in. In this second part of the series on Iran's October 1st, 2024 strikes, named Operation True Promise 2, we focus on the effects of the operation and Iran's underlying goals and intentions. Several stark paradoxes arise in this context that must be addressed. For instance, if Iran's ballistic missiles were capable of hitting a highly hardened target like an F-35 hangar, why did they fail to strike a large, soft target, such as the Mossad headquarters near Tel Aviv? A target that Iran could exploit much better for propaganda purpose? If Israel's missile defense systems are highly effective against Iran's most advanced missile types, how did they fail to protect the F-35 hangar at Nevatim Air Base, a high-value object at one of Israel's most protected military sites? Iran already hit one of the hangars which were still under construction in the April strikes with a small warhead. Furthermore, why did Iran choose to target the highly hardened Nevatim Air Base instead of focusing on softer, easier targets that would have been vulnerable even to just nearby explosions? What motivated the decision to strike hardened structures, like the F-35 hangar, rather than less hardened locations of the airbase? Another key question is why Iran targeted the runway and taxiways at Nevatim Air Base, despite knowing that no follow-up operation is planned to capitalize on the limited period during which air operations would be hindered. Typically, runways are targeted during sustained high-intensity campaigns to exploit this operational downtime. Moreover, if not much of importance was hit and the strike was a failure, why did Israel restrict the publication of damage footage? The censorship only allowed a few high-resolution images of Nevatim Air Base to be made public, and only several days after the strike. All these questions point to a single logical conclusion. The strike was primarily meant as a demonstration of Iran's capabilities. However, a critical aspect of the operation appears to have been to show that, given a large enough salvo of advanced missiles, Israel's heavily promoted and truly advanced ballistic missile defense system, such as the Arrow and David Sling, are insufficient to defend against Iran's missile-centric warfare. This strike hence sent a clear message. Iran has the capability to target any site within Israel, including its most critical assets, and it is Iran's decision alone whether or not to execute such strikes. The footage of the impacts left no doubt that only a systematic failure of Israel's defense systems could allow quick successive waves missile to hit in the manner observed. Had Iran escalated the situation by diverting more missiles towards softer, easier targets, such as Israel's civilian infrastructure, or redirected missiles meant for runways and taxiways to strike important, soft objects at the air bases, Israel might have responded in an irrational and dangerous manner. Therefore, the damage inflicted had to be carefully calibrated to serve primarily as a demonstration, bolstering Iran's deterrence posture while minimizing the risk of triggering an overreaction from nuclear-armed Israel. Israeli experts will recognize whether this is a calculated, constrained attack or not, especially when considering factors like statistical probabilities and symbolic actions, such as Iran's decision to strike an electrical box on the street leading to the Mossad headquarters in Tel Aviv, cutting power to the street lighting in nearby areas. While these actions may seem irrational to some biased analysts, who estimate the cost of such missiles in the millions of dollars, Iran almost certainly enjoys the luxury of using its missile arsenal for such symbolic and demonstration purposes due to the sheer scale of its arsenal. In this way, Iran signaled to Israel that its missile inventory is large enough to sustain such strikes. While many open source analysts may be unaware of the exact size of Iran's missile forces, Israeli experts, who track the number and scale of Iran's missile bases through satellite reconnaissance, can deduce which missile strikes were coincidental and which were deliberate. As a result, Israeli leadership will be briefed by its experts on the analyzed realities of the situation, leaving it to political decision makers to determine how to respond. As noted in the series covering the April strikes of Operation True Promise 1, Israel's aero ballistic missile defense system can handle many of Iran's older missile types, such as the Imad, with a reasonable kill probability. The Imad is a classical ballistic missile that follows a predictable parabolic trajectory and is equipped with a precision MARV, maneuverable re-entry vehicle, that relies on inflatable decoys, chaff and such class of countermeasures to defend against the Aero 3. Consequently, 
the EMAD remains vulnerable while flying outside the atmosphere, and would typically only be employed after Aero 3 batteries have been neutralized. The 20-year-old Goddard ballistic missile, closely related to the EMAD, is primarily used as a delivery system for submunition warheads and likely deploys decoys like chaff and flares. While the April strikes saw a limited number of more advanced missiles, notably the K-Bar Shekhan-1, this latest round of strikes also included the use of K-Bar Shekhan-2 missiles. Both K-Bar Shekhan-1 and 2 are aero-ballistic missiles equipped with glide vehicles, which are crucial for their specialized capabilities. The systematic and sequential nature of the successful strikes during the April operation can likely be attributed to the glide feature of the K-Bar Shekhan-1 missiles, which were used in very limited numbers. However, beside the EMOD in the October strikes, the salvo was composed predominantly of K-Bar Shekhan-1s, a smaller but notable portion consisting of K-Bar Shekhan-2s. The K-Bar Shekhan family of missiles, which is discussed in greater detail in a separate video, showcases several key advancements. The primary distinction between K-Bar Shekhan-1 and 2 lies in their range. The K-Bar Shekhan-2 extends the missile's reach from 1,450 kilometers to 1,800, thanks to the addition of a skip glide trajectory, instead of the somewhat simpler skip trajectory of the K-Bar Shekhan-1. This more advanced flight profile improves the missile ability to enter and remain within the atmosphere, staying below the operational envelope of systems like the Aero-3, which is designed to engage threats outside the atmosphere. The skip glide mechanism also allows the K-Bar Shekhan-2 to travel several hundred kilometers while performing random, low-magnitude evasive maneuvers. These maneuvers, though small in magnitude, are sufficient to complicate the targeting efforts of endo-atmospheric missile defense systems such as the Patriot Pac-2 and David Sling, reducing their chances of successful interception. All the mentioned features of the K-Bar Shekhan-2 also apply to the K-Bar Shekhan-1, but to a somewhat less effective level. The K-Bar Shekhan-2 missile can entirely evade Israel's Aero-3 system by staying outside its engagement envelope. This missile also defeats lower-tier ballistic missile defense systems like the Patriot Pac-2 and David's Sling by engaging aerodynamically with the Earth's atmosphere at an early stage and performing random evasive maneuvers, forcing interceptors to adjust their trajectories. These course corrections cause a significant depletion of the interceptor's kinetic energy state, severely limiting their ability to perform hard turns effectively in the final stages of flight. This makes it extremely difficult to hit a high-speed, randomly maneuvering object like the K-Bar Shikan 2's glide vehicle. The intense thermal and aerodynamic stress these glide vehicles endure is evident from instances of mid-air explosions caused by heat shield failures. These missiles travel at hypersonic speeds through the lower atmosphere to evade both Aero 3 and even Aero 2, which possesses endo-atmospheric interception capability, albeit at higher altitudes. Another key point of the operation is the absence of significant stunner interceptor launches by the David Sling system, which may indicate that the K-Bar Shikan glide vehicles arrived at such high speeds, likely maintaining hypersonic velocity, that the system's computers determined a successful interception would be infeasible. Interestingly, even the Iron Dome system, not designed to intercept such targets, was activated, launching Tamir interceptors that attempted, unsuccessfully, to engage the incoming re-entry vehicles. This overextension of Israel's ballistic missile defense assets highlights the sophistication and overwhelming nature of the attack. Due to Israel's strict information blackout, a comprehensive analysis of the damage from missiles that penetrated the defenses is difficult. However, available footage shows secondary explosions at the Tel Nof airbase, which suggests direct hits on military systems or assets. Additionally, some images show evidence that Iran may have used airburst fusing for some of the warheads to increase the destructive effect on soft targets, such as aircraft parked in the open. Low-resolution satellite images of Tel Nof indicate that aircraft may have been hit at that location. Israel claimed that most of the aircraft at Nevatim Air Base and others were flown into the air once it became clear that an Iranian strike was imminent, thus preventing their destruction on the ground. However, given that a portion of the fleet is always under maintenance or otherwise immobile, it is plausible that some aircraft may have been intentionally targeted by Iran. Another claim often heard by unofficial actors in the media 
is that the Israeli ballistic missile defenses omitted engagement of warheads, which were calculated to hit open fields. Since almost all missiles involved in the strikes possessed guided maneuverable re-entry vehicles, there is no chance to know what their intended target is until the last second before impact. One of the most critical aspects of the strike was the hit on the hangar complex used for Israel's Gulfstream-based ISR platforms, commonly called AWACS. While their hangar was hit directly, it remains unclear whether any aircraft inside were damaged or destroyed. In essence, the strike appears to have selectively targeted key systems critical to Israel's operational capabilities in a very limited fashion. The broader objective was to demonstrate Iran's military potential. The alleged severe damage caused on a non-IRGC S-300 fire control radar in Israel's April retaliation, allegedly by an incendiary quadcopter, in situ covert sabotage asset, meant that the destruction of an Israeli high-value system was likely a clear goal. Iran's larger message to Israel is clear. Should the coordinates of the targets be swapped with those that would inflict more substantial damage, such as striking the heart of Israel's military infrastructure, the consequences would be severe. The October strike demonstrated Iran's ability to launch large salvos from only a portion of its available missile bases and launchers. This implies that, in a full-scale conflict, Iran could carry out an even larger wave of attacks against Israel's primary air bases, potentially neutralizing their operational capability temporarily by disabling taxiways and runways. Once Israel's air power is sufficiently degraded, Iran could deploy cheaper, lower-tier assets like the Shahed-136 one-way attack drones to systematically hit critical elements of the air bases, such as fuel depots and munition storage. The operation also signaled Iran's capacity to systematically neutralize Israel's missile and air defense batteries, which could lead to a scenario where the Israeli Air Force has no significant operational capability, and its land-based air and missile defenses are rendered ineffective or neutralized. In summary, while the strike was primarily a demonstration, it carried a strong message of Iran's ability to degrade Israel's military power decisively if it chose to escalate. So that's all for today. If you enjoyed this video and like our work, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. We will try our best to answer your comments. Your support would be greatly appreciated and motivates to produce more content in the future. Thank you. And have a great day.